Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to my crash course in formal logic. In this part, we're going to study the crucial topic of categorical syllogisms. We're finally going to take categorical sentences in batches and try to draw conclusions from them. Now, last lesson was kind of short, but this lesson I'm definitely going to keep to my promise to give you two college-level lectures in one video, so hold on to your seats. Now, syllogism is a very broad term. It refers to any argument containing two premises and a conclusion. Categorical syllogism, by contrast, is a very specific term. It's a syllogism, but each of the three sentences, premises and conclusion, have to be categorical sentences. To illustrate, premise, premise, conclusion, syllogism. By contrast, categorical sentence, categorical sentence to a conclusion of a categorical sentence, that's your categorical syllogism. So just to give you a concrete example, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal, that is a categorical syllogism. Now, it may be a little difficult to see on the surface of it, but these are all categorical sentences of the, either the A, E, I, or O type. We just have to take all men are mortal and swap it out for all men are mortal beings, because mortal beings would designate a category. And as for Socrates as a man, how about instead all th a person's identical to Socrates? That way we have an appropriate subject class in that second premise. And just take these two uh, switches and put them into your conclusion. Instead of Socrates as a mortal, all persons identical to Socrates are mortal beings. You can see that we're moving from an A sentence and an A sentence to an A sentence. That makes this a categorical syllogism. Now let's take a look at these terms that occur in the categorical syllogism, men, mortals, and Socrates. They're kind of links in a chain, and the way they, those terms hook up makes all the difference in the world to whether an argument works or not. There's a term that occurs twice in the premises, a crucial link. That's called the middle term. Again, thinking of these uh, terms as links in a chain, there's something special about the one that occurs twice among the premises. That is sort of a middle, a link up, that hooks up the other two terms in the syllogism. Those other two terms are hooked up in the conclusion in an interesting way. Those terms are called the major, major term and minor term, and they occur in the conclusion. So, look again. The term men occurs twice in the premises, and the term mortal and Socrates, which also occur in the premises, are linked up in the conclusion. It's the middle term that's doing that hookup. So, let's uh, get a closer look here by deleting some stuff. Let's take a look at those other terms. The other term, mortal beings, is called the major term. It is one, occurs one time in the premises and once in the conclusion as the predicate. Remember, the major term is the predicate of the conclusion. Now there's also another term that occurs within the premises one time. It's the term persons identical to Socrates here. That term occurs one time in the conclusion as the subject. So the minor term of the argument, which gets linked up to the major term through the middle term, is the term that occurs one time in the conclusion as a subject. So here you have it again, three terms, each occurring two times in the argument, but where those terms occur makes all the difference as to whether they count as major, minor, and of course the crucial middle. Now we also have something in addition to the major and minor terms in a categorical syllogism. We have the major and minor premises. Because the major term occurs only once in the premises, you can spot it as uh, the major premise, and because the minor term occurs only one time in the premises, wherever that term occurs, it's going to be called the minor premise. Again, that's just because in contrast to the middle term, these terms occur only once in the premises, hence they can designate the premises as major and minor in virtue of that fact. Now, now when all the previous conditions for a categorical syllogism are met, and the major premise is listed first, as of course major things probably should be, then the categorical syllogism is said to be in standard form. And I'm going to talk a little bit here about standard form, so take some notes. Now standard form categorical syllogisms are all that we're going to need to analyze from here on. It's all we're going to study. And it may not be obvious to you as to why that's the case. Look at the argument to the left that we've been studying for quite a while. It's pretty much the same as the argument to the right, isn't it? I just swapped out two of the premises, one for the other, but they're the same premises, so if one argument is valid, so is the other. And yet, one of these is approved according to the standards of standard form, and the other's corrupt. Why in the world think that? 
And on top of the fact that you st just wind up with the same argument when you transform a non-standard into a standard form, uh, it's kind of tedious. Consider this example. All watercolors are paintings. Some watercolors are masterpieces. It does follow from this that some paintings are masterpieces. But masterpieces, as you see from the conclusion, is the major term. So we got to swap out and put that major premise as the first one. Well, that seems tedious in addition to the fact that it just winds us up with the exact same argument. So why even do that? Well, sticking to this standard form reduces the number of moods of arguments that we're going to have to analyze. And when I refer to moods, I'm talking about the order of sentence types when a syllogism is in standard form. Now, you could define mood a little differently just to be any uh, string of sentence types. With our Socrates men immortal uh, argument, we end up with an A premise followed by an A premise followed by an A for a conclusion. So our sentence types for this argument and the mood thereof would be A, A, A. Or consider the watercolors example. We had a particular premise first and a universal premise second followed by a particular conclusion, an IAI. But this argument, in contrast to the last one, uh, would give us different moods to analyze to see if it was valid if we allowed different premise orders. Notice that. If we swapped out the green box and the red box there, we'd end up with an AII mood for the argument. Why not just stick with the major uh, forms, or rather standard forms, and that way we'll have fewer moods to analyze when we try to figure out which arguments are valid and which ones are not. It's a good argument for sticking with standard form. Well, let's review thus far. If you have two premises and a conclusion, that's a syllogism by definition. And if they're all categorical sentences involved, then you have a categorical syllogism. And if the major premise is listed first, followed by the minor, then the conclusion, you have one that is in standard form. And then you can analyze it according to its mood. That is the order of sentence types in an argument. But in order to tell whether or not a categorical syllogism is valid, we're going to need to know more. Specifically, whether or not that mood of a standard form categorical syllogism is valid depends upon figure. If you know the arguments in standard form, you know roughly where the major, minor, and middle terms are going to show up. You know the major term is going to be in premise 1 in the conclusion, for example. But figure nails down where these terms show up, and that's when we know exactly what type of argument we're dealing with and whether it's valid or not. To illustrate the need, we used an example before involving watercolors being masterpieces and paintings. Now, if this is an IAI form, as we said before, now does the validity of this argument show us that an IAI mood of a standard form categorical syllogism will always be valid? Try this uh, on for size. I'm going to swap uh, the positions of the middle and minor term, middle and major term, in the first and second premise, respectively. Some flying animals are animal mammals, I'm sorry. All elephants are mammals. So does it prove that some elephants are flying animals? I don't think that conclusion follows. But again, we're dealing with an IAI mood. Obviously, to find out which IAIs are valid or not, we need to nail down where the middle term occurs and whether it occurs in the proper spot in each of the premises. How are we going to do that? Well, here I'm going to call in a little help from a big friend. Uh, not a personal friend at all. In fact, not even a logician. Multiple time Mr. Olympia, Jay Cutler. Man, look at the size of this guy's back. It's a guy who uh, maybe likes to work on his figure quite a bit. So, for those uh, in the mood to show off their figures, uh, let's use this guy as an illustration, or rather a mnemonic device to remember what figures there are for us to memorize. Now, there are exactly four figures, places that the middle term could show up, assuming that the predicate of the conclusion will be uh, in the first premise of the argument. The middle term, as in figure one, could be listed first, and then listed second in premise number two, and so on and so forth. These pretty well exhaust all the ways that the middle term could show up in the premises of an argument. How in the world is Jay Cutler going to help us remember figure one, two, three, and four? Well, maybe this isn't helpful for you, but it sure helps me out an awful lot. So, thank you, Jay Cutler. So, now what we've done is we've pinpointed where that middle term is going to show up in any given premise. And that's what we needed to do to get around that problem with the uh, flying elephants example earlier, right? So now we can tell which 
arguments, categorical syllogisms that is, are going to be valid or were not. That's some good news, but there's also some bad news. The good news is now that we know can pinpoint where the middle term is, thanks to figures, we can take an inventory of all the valid categorical syllogisms. What use is that though? You gonna memorize them all? Well, th here comes some more good and bad news. In the Middle Ages, they did come up with a method to memorize all the valid moods given a figure. Here you go, people. Uh, somebody made a list of names in the Latin so that under each figure just listed, you could tell which mood is going to be a valid one. Under figure one, Barbara is a famous example. AAA is valid on one. The mood EAE is also valid, and so on and so forth. So all you have to do, guys, to memorize which uh, mood is valid on which figure is to memorize Barbara, Celerant, Dari, Fario, Barbary, so on and so forth, all the way through. Isn't that easy? Heck no, it's not easy. To make matters worse, this covers all the arguments or standard form syllogisms that are valid. Notice there's a distinction here. The ones at the top are very different from the ones at the bottom. The ones at the top are unconditionally valid. Those are the ones that are valid given Boolean assumptions, namely that universals uh, premises have no existential import. But there's the Aristotelian uh, categorical syllogisms, the ones that are valid on the assumption that the universals carry existential import. So in addition to memorizing this list of names, you're going to have to memorize the distinctions between what's valid on which assumption. Oh boy, how can we make this easy? Um, I guess if you want to make use of mood, for, figure, and uh, standard form to tell which arguments are valid or not, you've got a lot of memorizing ahead of you, don't you? Well, let me help you out here. There's a problem and a benefit to this little example listed here in the gray. There's a certain form, EIO, that is valid on every single figure. And that's what I'm going to make use of to revise this very old and time-honored uh, mnemonic device, if it deserves to be called a mnemonic device at all. Who wants to memorize this list of Latin names? For my two cents, you shouldn't do it. It's obsolete, and I'm going to come up with something better. The thing that I think is better, I call the neighbor's mnemonic. Those uh, form, uh, figures and moods that I listed uh, in the gray, they all take the pattern or mood EIO. EIO is valid on every single one of the figures that we studied. And I'm going to make use of that to come up with a superior mnemonic device, that which been, has been used throughout uh, the ages. So to get our new project going, I'm going to need a little help from my friends Barbara Streisand, known for her political singing and movie career, and also Alfonso Ribierto, who's known for his roles in classic sitcoms that many of you watched, and lastly Orlando Bloom, who's probably best known for his role as Legolas in the Lord of the Rings series. Notice the neat thing is each of these persons has a name that corresponds, uh, a modern and not a Latin name, that corresponds to some of the valid moods on each of the figures, the AAA. AOO and the OAO. I wonder if we can use this in order to memorize our valid moods given a figure. Think of this first Barbara's neighbors maiming feared. I'm not asking you why Barbara has neighbors who fear maiming. Just remember that phrase Barbara's neighbors maiming feared. And notice I'm using the word neighbors here. Look at figure number one and the moods that are valid on it under Boolean assumptions. Barbara's Neighbors Maiming Feared covers each and every one of these in the English, not with those ridiculous lists of Latin names. You're one step towards getting all the valid moods given figures uh, one through four. Let's see if we can make the rest of those leaps. We'll make that next little jump with Alfonso's help. Alfonso's neighbors apparently don't like to have jobs. Don't ask me why, but Alfonso's neighbors feared careers, just as much as Barbara's neighbors maiming feared. So if you can remember that Alfonso's neighbors feared careers, you're just one step closer to memorizing all of the uh, valid moods given a figure. Only this time it's going to be figure number two. On figure number two, Alfonso's neighbors maim, uh, feared careers, 
uh, corresponds in terms of the vowels in it to the vowels listed in each one of the Latin names in figure two. Congratulations, you're one step closer. Can we make the last two leaps to figure three and figure four? In fact, we're going to do both of them at the same time. With a little help from Orlando Bloom. Orlando's neighbors disdain maiming and disdain careers for neighbors. I got a whole bunch of people showing disdain towards careers up in my little uh, picture here. I hope you can remember it. It's goofy and just goofy enough to be remembered. But if you can remember that Orlando's neighbors disdain maiming and disdain careers for neighbors, then you've gone all the way towards memorizing the valid moods given figures. Which figure does that handle? Figure three and four together. Notice that figure three has four valid uh, moods on Boolean assumption and figure four has three valid moods. So while this isn't a perfect uh, example or illustration or mnemonic device, Orlando's neighbor's disdain maiming corresponds to all the vowels listed under figure three in the names thereof. And disdain careers for neighbors, as long as you can list Four as not an extra word. After all, what sort of valid mood would have just one O, F O R? Get rid of that, and you have disdain careers neighbors, and that corresponds in terms of its vowels to all of the valid moods under figure four. Congratulations, you're done. So remember, uh, instead of Barbara, Celerant, Dari, Ferio, and all this other stuff that comes under the green portion, that is the portion of this va uh, diagram that lists valid Boolean moods. Well, let's just take it a different route. How about instead, Barbara's neighbors maiming feared, Alfonso's neighbors feared careers, Orlando's neighbors disdain maiming and disdain careers for neighbors. There you go. You're done. Now, isn't that mnemonic a little silly? Uh, I guess we can answer that question forthrightly. It's about as silly as it comes. Barbara's neighbors maiming feared, Alfonso's neighbors feared careers, Orlando's neighbors disdain maiming and disdain careers for neighbors. Well, I just memorized all the valid moods, and it's not as silly as trying to remember all those Latin lady names, unless you have just a good memory in Latin. And one last big note, there's another advantage to my de uh, mnemonic device, uh, apart from that mnemonic device that's better than the mnemonic device where you memorize all those Latin for any word that I use in that mnemonic device, for example, the uh, word feared, it's used to denote that EAE is valid on a particular uh, figure. And I never repeat any other word where EAE is going to be valid. Any place you find feared is where EAE is going to be valid. Any place you don't find the word feared, EAE is invalid. And that goes for every word and every possible combination of vowels in the mnemonic device. Pretty helpful, huh? Well, we still have one last issue here. My little mnemonic device just taught you how to memorize all the moods given a figure that are valid under Boolean assumptions. But what about all those that are valid under Aristotelian assumptions? Notice that in these Latin names, when you look at the vowels in red, you start off with A and E, or E and A, or A and A, universals, and then you move to I's and O's for conclusions. In other words, the universals must have existential import because you're reaching a conclusion that's an I or an O sentence, and those are known to have existential import. Is there any way for memorizing these? I want to point out one thing that may be helpful in memorizing. Captain Hernando in his plane, and he's being chased by some other pilots. Uh, Captain Hernando, uh, likes to go upwards with his plane. All these other pilots are trying to attain his trajectory. If they're trying to attain Hernando's trajectory, then remember this. There are only three valid Aristotelian moods for any figure. If you go back to all those names that were listed uh, under the Aristotelian valid moods in the yellow in the previous slide, you only found three combinations of vowels that worked. A-A-I, E-A-O, and A-E-O are the only combinations that are ever going to turn out valid, regardless of figure. Hope this mnemonic device turns out helpful for you. Well, I hope this has been a helpful lesson for you. It certainly helps you memorize the concepts of categorical syllogism, mood figure, and all the other related concepts. And it gives you a helpful mnemonic device to take all that knowledge and put it to some practical use. So just stick to it, and you're going to memorize a whole lot and get good A's in your college courses, and you're going to do so really quickly. In the meantime, as usual, uh, hang around for my exercises on this lesson and my next logic lesson, which will be coming up soon. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.